Hello and welcome to another episode of the MXGP podcast show on Vital MX, the fourth round of the 2024 FIM Motocross World Championship has been and gone, the Grand Prix of Trentino. And as always, the track that most riders hate delivered in a big way. And we will get into that and more on this episode of the MXGP podcast. Of course, our ability to talk about MXGP is made possible by the support from Polisport, All Balls Racing, and EVS Sports. So thank you to them for their continued support of this growing podcast and now video podcast. Yes, we are on YouTube as well as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever else you listen. So you can get your fix just about anywhere. Stay tuned when we have AI soon. I don't know how, but that will be coming. I'm Lewis Phillips, your host, joined by Paddock Pass Podcast Man, which is actually quite hard to say, I've just realised. Paddock Pass Podcast Man, Adam Wheeler, fresh from Texas. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm glad I'm a, a podcast man. Yep. Uh, I'm not a big man. No. I'm just a podcast man. That's, that's somewhat of a... Um, I mean, look, I insult a lot of people. Just take that as a compliment and move on. Uh, Lewis, can I just say how bitterly disappointed I am in this latest show in that once again, we don't have a guest, but yet you managed to organize Paul Jonas to appear on the Pulp show. I mean, it's very clear where your priorities lie. Yes, you know, I'm disappointed in myself. Um, I take 100% of the blame. There was a technical issue where last night the video software we use for YouTube updated and completely destroyed the triple screen um, where the rider's head would be. So that scared me because I didn't trust my ability to fix that in time for the morning. But as I said last week, <laughs> do not lose faith in us. Um, we now have two weeks off from MXGP. So we will use that time to rethink, recalibrate and come back after the break with all of the riders on at once. We'll do a group podcast with the entire paddock to make up for it. Um, like a round table. Yeah. But can we also blame Husqvarna MX2? To, well, MX2? There's no reason really an MXGP anymore. Uh, Husqvarna Racing Team Manager Rasmus Jorgensen, because um, as well as being a friend of ours, he uh, turned us down. He wasn't available. He's in Austria for meetings. So uh, I guess that's an acceptable excuse. Yeah, he said he said, Have you even mentioned my name once on the podcast? And I said, Yeah, surprisingly. <laughs> like we actually spend a lot of time talking about you, probably more than your riders. So I think he felt um happy. And if we can make one person happy, Adam, I'm I'm also happy because um it's a tough old road. So you mentioned uh Paul's Jonas on the Pulp MX show. He had an interesting point which I had not heard. So we'll start with that. I haven't I haven't listened to the interview yet, so don't make any spoilers uh, okay well okay i've got to give you a little spoiler here um he said right i'll go on then yeah he said that they are trying and planning to bring the nations to trentino so i don't know uh, uh okay um it's impossible that was his revelation was it he he said it I with thought, like you conviction. know you're gonna say kegums again because you know being a latvian and being so one of the premium latvian sportsmen uh, how, how how come he's got the inside line on Trentino, apart from the fact he may have just eavesdropped on some conversation last weekend? I don't know. You know, Paul's, he's a man of many talents, a social butterfly, if you will. <laughs> um, yeah, like, if this is true, I don't, like, in my mind, this idea is a non-starter. Like, it's impossible. Absolutely impossible. Unless they're going to buy all of the surrounding land, extend the track and therefore the spectator areas and therefore the parking, it's impossible. There's no way you can even like consider it in a boardroom, in my mind. Yeah, um, for the benefit of our American listeners, um, Pietro Morata, which is the, the proper name for the track in Arco de Trento, uh, the Grand Prix of Trentino, is an extremely compact venue. I mean, it's probably the most picturesque one in MXGP, but uh, it is very, very small, very scratchy. And, you know, just to give you an illustration of what I mean, I think um, some years we had to actually park in the vineyard next door to the circuit, which required some careful maneuvering with your rental car, because otherwise you were scratching, uh, you know, paintwork on the sides of these big um, branches and, and stakes that they have to put this thing into place. But I cannot see the nations there, Lewis. The only thing is they could get away with charging a pretty premium price and then selling out the venue. They could say, we can fit 18,000 people in this place and that's it. 
you know, uh, and then you could create the most atmospheric bonkers event possible. That is actually, yeah, that's quite smart. Um, I believe that would infuriate many and not help in France's reputation, but that would actually be quite a cool idea, like a VIP nations. Yeah, it would be very exclusive, uh, but uh, it would be an ultimate headache because, like you say, they just don't have the in infrastructure or the, the capacity to, you know, to to host a, let alone a Grand Prix. You and I have debated this before, you know, is, you know, Arco de Trento and that sort of setting really a Grand Prix, a world championship worthy uh, venue? I mean, it's been on the champ, it's been on the calendar now for like for more than 10 years, I think. So, and actually, um, I saw, uh, I was working in Cota for the MotoGP last weekend and I saw Ryan Villapodo there and um, sort of actually bumped into him in the pit lane where he was told off by security for holding a coffee cup because you're not supposed to be eating or drinking in the pit lane. And, uh, you know, we were trying to talk over the din of the motorcycles. And, um, you know, I said that this weekend was Trentino and sort of had a little smile at him because obviously that was the scene of his, uh, his loop and his uh, adios, not only from Grand Prix and MXGP, but from racing full time. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to talk with him more over the weekend. I did see Marvin Muscan as well. He was there too. I feel like, um, and we've said this before, if you copy and pasted Trentino and moved it to anywhere in the world without the mountains, without Lake Garda uh, nearby, a massive tourist destination. It would get so much more hate from riders, teams, complaints, but the location saves it from all of that. Yeah, and actually it's quite a versatile track when you think about it, because it is stony, it's, it's, it's worked on, it can get quite rough. But, you know, it's been reversed before, it's been changed. There's, there's quite a bit that they've done to it in the past. So you, you think... Actually, we've been to tracks before, say maybe to Chantalte or Kessel in Germany. That's the first one that springs to mind. But places where they haven't been able to do anything. Or saint jean d'Angeli, for example, is another one. But, uh, you know, actually, Pietro Morata, they have been able to shift things around and, and try different stuff. I will say, like, I've never, I, I've always enjoyed Trentino, but for some reason, it was only last week that it struck me how incredible it's been for us over the years. Like we always have great racing in part because speeds are so similar. There's not that much, there's not that many places to pass. So it's a create some um, close racing, but like it has, yeah, the 2021 triple header there, incredible. Um, all of those races were just, that was the best racing I've ever seen in my life and will probably ever see. And then even this past weekend, I could argue, honestly, I could argue that Prado, Fevra, Geyser and Hurlings were all the best rider at different points in the weekend. Like I have no conviction over who was the best rider in Trentino. And that's in part because of the track. So it does deserve some applause, even though the riders really aren't fans of it. Yeah, it is. It's a really bizarre place because it, it is, it's largely conditioned by the starts. You know, if you have a nightmare at the start, then you're creating a big headache for yourself. That could apply to maybe 60 or 70% of the, the GP tracks anyway. People complain that it's hard to overtake on, but as we saw with Jeffrey Hurlings at the weekend, and we saw most famously with Tony Cairola in 2017, I want to say, uh, you know, you can find a way through on riders. You can find little slots, little places that actually work for you. But then we've seen, we've seen some, like you said, we've seen some really memorable stuff there over the years, a triple header during the sort of COVID time. Obviously the promoters there at Pietro Morata work very closely within front motor racing. And that's not something to be taken lightly, uh, you know, to have like a, a really mutually beneficial promotional relationship because it just helps you get through some difficult times. And maybe Arco de Trento is going to be the Italian round for the foreseeable uh, on the Grand Prix calendar. But think of the stuff we've seen, Luis. I mean, Jorge Prado's first win, uh, Villapodo's loop out, like I've said, uh, Cairoli's famous um, charge, like I've said. What else? Um, Tommy uh, Tommy Sell, I remember throwing his Kawasaki around, just creating some outrageous shapes. It has that ridiculous triple up the hill, which is pretty spectacular. Where else do we have jumps as big as that on Grand Prix? Perhaps only in Lommel with a big quad. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other ones. Hurlings in 2021 one in when Thailand he had, a few years ago. Uh, he just like lost his mind and crashed twice massively. Um, exploded after the finish jump. That sticks out in my mind because it was just like, what is... <laughs> that was the point where I was like, okay, 2021 is officially like ruining everyone. Like we're all losing our minds, including the riders. What are you... Honestly, if, just box me up and send me back to 2021 because what a year. Yeah, there's still a hangover. There's still a little bit of a hangover from it. I'm, I'm never going to be the same again. Out, uh... <laughs> this is um, Tim Geiger's home track 
really, isn't it? It's where, it's where his fan club congregate in one part of the circuit. There's always like red and yellow flares going off. I think it might have also been the scene of Tim's first career win as well, yep. or first moto win. Uh, so, you know, he has a real close connection to this Grand Prix. It's that sort of uh, hard pack, slippery terrain that he often excels in or did in the first part of his career. And maybe he's slightly disappointed not to have taken his second moto win over the weekend at some point. Yeah, honestly, I felt uh, second moto when Tim was in fifth. I was like, okay, Tim will win this or at least get close to winning this. And the progress just kind of stalled. Obviously, Prado ended up winning. And for the fourth time this year, uh, he's unbeaten. And I have two ways that I can view Prado's weekend. A, you can you can decide. A, he faced adversity and still overcame that to win, so it was incredible. Or B, he showed weakness for the first time, and now Tim, Roman, and Jeffrey are really going to be chomping at the bit and realise that this gladiator has chinks in his armour. I firmly agree with A. Okay. Because you know you cannot legislate for your seat coming loose in qualification and being 17th in the gate. And then he duly obliged by unleashing the most powerful part of his arsenal, which is his starts, and put himself into contention with victory. He shouldn't have been able to do that. I mean, I think if you put Febra, Hurlings, Geyser down 17th in that place on the grid, then they're going to be struggling more than Jorge Prado at this current moment in time. So, yeah, I think um, Prado, you know, made a bit of a statement there and also showed, I think, when he sort of raises himself up from that 70, 80 percent full throttle going for it, then he also can be pretty feisty and determined with what he wants to do. Is this uh, two week break at a terrible time for Prado? He will be able to maybe catch up on some testing that he missed out on because of his Supercross experience, but... This will halt his momentum somewhat. And I know for a fact that a lot of the other riders are like, okay, this, these two weekends are my time to figure this out. And I will come out swinging in uh, Agueda or Agada. Well, it's interesting that Agada, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that Jeffrey, for example, um, you know, he was still suffering from the ribs that he banged up in Sardinia in Agada Trento. And now will be the time to really sort of recuperate. But obviously, they perhaps weren't that bad because he's going to be racing more in the UK uh, and I can't remember where else. I mean, he's doing two consecutive weekends of of domestic competition uh, and perhaps that's just part of his, his program to get back up, up to full form, uh, full confidence. But then they also come with risks, don't they? I mean, how frustrating would it be if he has some sort of prang and, you know, going into Portugal, he's carrying another knock. How much do you believe that the British Championship pays Hurlings for these one-off appearances? Because he's doing it for the money, obviously. Um, how much would you guess? Uh, it, doesn't it depend a little bit on the track and the promoter? Nope. I, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you the number, but I'll tell you higher or lower than your uh, estimation. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, so so for appearing in the British Championship, I'd say probably 20 grand. Okay, less. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, 10? Uh, higher. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so somewhere in between 10 and 20. Yeah, um, but, yeah uh, no, just random. Uh, random but Lewis, can, can I to come back? Uh, something I, I want to comment on is um, I think maybe we've overlooked the fact that I think Geyser is on a similar comeback um, philosophy or program as Hurlings. You know, we, we on this podcast and, you know, also you can see some of it on social media, Hurlings is building his way back after like a torrid year last year. And I think Geish is on the same program after breaking his femur, ironically, at this circuit pre-season last year. I still think Geish is building up to a point where, you know, he is the second best rider behind Jorge Prado. That's that's borne out for the championship standings. He's not far behind the Spaniard. But then, you know, he's won one moto out of this of the eight. Maybe he should have done a bit better in Trentino, but then I also think he's 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 building up. What I don't know is you know how he currently feels on the race bike for this year. Whether there's still some work to do on setup, uh, maybe he's pushing too much or he's not feeling completely confident on the motorcycle. That's probably where our uh, our journalistic um, integrity has fallen down a little bit, and we need to find that out. But I still think um, there's a lot more to come from guys. Well, I would use Moto One in Trentino as proof that. Like he was very aggressive, he was very, uh, charging very hard. That looked like a man who was very comfortable to me. Um, I don't believe he would have yeah. been able to reach uh, that level without some sort of comfort. Yeah, it's just 
I mean, the the attention is being grabbed by Prado and Febra, who was also, you know, actually looked like he had raised his game a little bit as well in Italy. But then I think we, we can talk about Tim a bit more because this was such a powerful sort of Grand Prix for him in the past because of the history and because of the support. So I think, you know, you cannot say anything on one hand because he's second in the championship and racking up the points and doing what he needs to do to stay in this fight. You know, pretty much like, say, Cooper Webb or Eli Tomac has been doing through Supercross. But then, you know, on the other side, perhaps uh, this was a good place to, to you know, put the flag in the ground and say, right, you know, I, I'm back. I'm, I'm really going for it. Well, yeah, I can play that A and B game again with Tim because A, uh, perfect podium streak, been there, not faltered at all, whereas Hurlings and Roman have given up points here and there and now are facing a deficit. Tim's neutral. Like, he's a couple of points down, but not far enough to really prompt any sort of discussion. Um so that's the positive, A. Or B, um, he should have left Trentino with a red plate. It was right there for the taking. After What was he down after Saturday? A? 10? 13? Yeah, I mean, Prado, Prado didn't score. So he you know, he made a, a pretty decent decent comeback from that, didn't he? Yeah, I'm just, but uh, So you could argue that also. Like I say, I fully expected him to um, win <laughs> or come close to winning the second moto. Like I, when he was in fifth, I was like, well, guys, uh, we'll do this. Especially after Moto One and well, his got, track record in Trentino, I've just got his record up now. I mean, he's been pretty faultless on Saturdays, right? I mean, he won in Argentina, and then he's gone second, second, second. So you know, whereas Prado before has been, you know, really making hay with the points on the Saturday, guys just perfectly keeping pace. I mean, there's only what. He's on 206 points and Prado's on 219. You have to go quite some way back to February and 174. I mean, that's that's quite a sizable gap that Prado has over over the Frenchman. But uh, Guy at the moment is, is doing exactly what he needs to do. But I just wonder if he is frustrated that he hasn't taken more checkered flags. I, I don't know. I, I just don't feel like Tim gets frustrated. I said this last week about bike setup and I feel the same results wise. I feel like he is very neutral um, as which is a lovely segue into this discussion point. Have we been too hard on Tim? Because I feel as though, okay, I will straight up admit, we probably haven't talked about him enough after Spain or Sardinia, but that's because he's been doing so well that he's there, as I said. Hurlings and Fevre have dominated the conversations because they have lost so many points that the question mark is, oh, have they already lost too many? Whereas Tim has just... As I said last week, I stand by it. An anonymous start to the season, not in a bad way, in the form of just, he's not grabbed headlines, he's just been there, done his job, and not made mistakes. You can grab headlines either good ways or yeah. bad ways. Um, so, yeah, I feel like that's not he's a been, discredit. Yeah. Now, he's been part of the furniture, and deservedly, I think Prado has taken the headlines because he's won. He's had that super cross adventure. People will know what he wants wants what he's going to do next year hurlings of course has this comeback narrative behind him and then february you could argue is in a similar kind of story arc to to geyser in terms of being extremely competitive going to be one of the championship favorites and um you know just hasn't been able to really show anything against the gas gas rider so i don't think we've been uh um uh, well perhaps we have been a little bit critical of tim when he's exactly in the game and uh you know i don't think we both of us just want to see him take it to Prado a little bit more. In a way, yeah, it's a compliment. Um, of course, no one will view it that way because that's not fun. But it's a compliment because we expect the very, very best out of him. Um, like I, Tim doesn't really appear on my radar unless he's winning because I'm like, yeah, Tim, Tim can win on any given weekend. Um, unless obviously something bad happens, a la Fevre, Jeffrey, thus far this year. Um, also, okay, part two, that's done. Part two, is saying that he's a safe, reliable pair of hands for the championship, an insult. Because I feel that is not a backhanded compliment in any way. I feel that is quite a, quite a testament for a man who was anything but a safe, reliable pair of hands at the start of his career. Yeah, and also when he's been fit, he's either won or it's gone down to the last round. So again, the, the statistics sort of weigh in his favour for that. I mean, he is um, just like solid personified uh so yeah i don't think um you're you're being too outrageous by saying that lewis it's uh even the thing i was pointing out about earlier about his bike setup 
even if we did reach out and try to ask people, I'm sure, you know, as, as usual, uh, the comments would be pretty elusive, you know, um, Tim's feeling good. He's feeling all right. Or the team are working, you know, when potentially you hate something about the setup, I don't know. I mean, this is also something of a contrast for with MotoGP at the weekend where Honda were abysmal, uh, you know, again, they were the back markers in, in, on the, on the asphalt. And you had a rider like Takanaka Gami, who's um, the only Japanese rider on the MotoGP grid, uh, HRC stalwart his whole career. And he was saying it's almost unacceptable, I think, just to paraphrase, um, that their motorcycle this year is slower than it was last year when it was already a problem bike. So you have this um, this idea in MotoGP that the riders are very critical because they're trying to orientate direction in a positive way. Whereas I think you know in motocross, there's still a little bit of that fear of saying, well, actually, we're not really where we want to be. Uh, you know, I'm not happy, um, you know, help. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah. In reality, the only way you find out if someone isn't happy in this sport is through Chinese whispers. Um, you never get it direct. Well, unless you have a really good relationship and you can get it off record, um, you never just get a quote saying, yeah, I'm struggling with this, this and this. Um, at, I could say something here, but I'm not going to because I do not believe that I should say it. So... I'm going to try to come up with another thing to say and move on, which would be a lovely segue into Roman. Let's just do that because... because That was fantastic radio, Louis. Thank I'm you. sure everyone well, appreciated that. It would have been smooth if I said what was on my brain, but I had to remove that from my brain <laughs> and put it somewhere else. No, I was just going to say... Well, now, I was just going to say, in reality, a PR person should be the one communicating this. If they hear you say on this podcast it sounds like Tim is unhappy, they should be reaching out and saying blah, 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 blah. Heads up, this is where this comment came well, from. But we're also just speculating and being, you know, hypothetical. I mean, Geyser might be super happy with this bike. And, but this uh, is where the PR you know, man comes in. Um, do, 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 do. Hi, Adam, just to yes. let you know, those comments were not related to the bike. He had a poorly finger or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, if we're trying to put a finger on why Tim has only won one moto from eight to start the season... Uh, you know, and if we are sort of, you know, uh, again, speculating it might be mechanical or technical, uh, then, you know, uh, will will the team want to come out and say that? Well, they can. This you know. is where, you, as a PR man, you play the game. You figure out the ways to, like, uh, get make it so that we have somewhat of a correct story that relates well to Honda without... Um, because obviously it's no good for you, Adam, last week said that uh, he may be unhappy with a bike. You, that's also alarming for Honda. Anyway. Well, can I, can I also point out that it can be quite hard to see as well through a goldfish bowl? Well, there is that as well. I like the goldfish bowls. Um, I made, I made okay. a great joke about Ferrato in the goldfish bowl, but you'll get to that shortly. Um, but no, to your point about why Tim hasn't won more and Roman and Jeffrey, Prado's just been the best guy. Like, it's that cut and dry in my mind yeah. i do not believe that this trend continues so fiercely once we come back from this break i really believe that uh, hurling's favorite and geyser will all kind of find that level somewhat but prado's been the best guy and if someone wants to debate that sure but uh, facts don't lie and um, the lap times the whole shots the starts the results the points they all point in one direction like you can't get mad at that hakuna matata yeah he's setting the standard He's, that's it. Yeah. Um, Roman, Roman's a funny one, isn't he? Because <laughs> after last week where I said that I had more faith in Hurlings reeling off 1-1-1-1 one, 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 one and like clawing back the points, Roman realistically could have and maybe should have done that this past weekend. Um, I, I believe if he didn't crash, potentially he could have won the second moto. Either way, he would have won the GP and gained points. So... In one way, I want to shout and scream about how amazing Roman is and like how we continue to underestimate him. But then in the other way, I'm like, this is also kind of Roman. Let's not forget, he didn't win the 2021 title because he tipped over on the last lap in Turkey and gave up 10 points or whatever. Yeah, this, I mean, this result sheet, winning the, on Saturday, winning the first mode on Sunday, then making a mistake and finishing, what, fifth? In the second moto, that sort of encapsulates largely his sort of term in Kawasaki, it would seem, you know, where it's just excellence with a, you know, a small shortcoming and then it's, it proves costly. I mean, also Trentino is um, a great sort of venue for Febra and that fantastic kind of 
throttle control and, and feeling for grip that he has. So uh, if, I think he probably would have been one of the most frustrated riders on Sunday, just because, like you say, he could have completed the set very easily. And uh, let's not forget that he really hates Prado. So that is just generally frustrating for him <laughs> anyway. Um, I do believe, and everyone will laugh and shout at me for this, but I do believe that Hurlings took a massive step forward in Trentino. Uh, proof of that is the fact that he came out on Instagram and said, I have the speed to win. And he's been very like downplaying his ability this year. So for him to come out on Instagram and be like, yeah, I had that. That's quite a statement in my mind. But even look at the lap times. He came through the field um, in the second moto after crashing in turn two remarkably well. I believe that this was, similar to 2017, a turning point for him in his season. And again, this we these weeks off will only help. Yeah, it was a very typical Arco de Trento crash, wasn't it, in the second turn, just like breaking rear wheel traction. He was kind of lucky in a way because he was just about to take third place. And if he had, you know, he was lucky someone didn't tag him. But I think we saw Lucas Kunin have a similar kind of slip in, in the MX2 class. So, you know, it is it is a difficult track. It's not um, straightforward and it's not just like a horsepower fest. But, uh, you know, he, again, like we said on the last podcast, Lewis, you know, Jeffrey needs to really hammer those starts. He has to improve them because uh, at the moment that's where, you know, um, Prado just senses an Achilles heel. And he thinks, you know, if I can get ahead and get away, then whatever speed Hurlings has, he's going to have to either work extremely hard or he's going to, you know, risk a mistake like we saw in Sardinia to, to catch me. Funny, um, when he crashed in the second turn of Moto2, it wasn't a big crash. Any other rider, I would have just like not even bat an eyelid and be like, oh, they're going to come from last. Jeffrey crashes like that and my mind immediately goes, he's going to get hit. He's going to get hit and he's going to get injured. This is just, this is so going to happen. And I like, yeah, just funny. With Jeffrey, you just have a, a, a knee-jerk reaction to any sort of crash that the absolute <laughs> worst possible scenario is going to play out. But it didn't. So. I am, um, we, no, we, um, well, I'm, I, uh, you know, have been a, a little critical of the TV production and, you know, not, nothing really been different for 2024. I actually want to applaud, like, Infra Motor Racing for trying up that drone over the, the, the big triple up the hill which is just, you know, Hurlings crashed on the entry to that section. Did you see it? Because I thought it looked pretty good. Yeah, I'm not, I don't really like drones in general. Supercross, MXGP, uh, outdoors. I don't know. I don't really, I don't know. I don't really feel like they help me in any way in my viewing experience. Yeah, but it's like they have, in football, they have this spider cam, which is attached to the, the cables and weaves across the pitch. And it brings you a, a, you know, a sight of a football match that you rarely get. It's a bird's eye view, almost literally. And I think it would work really well for, for motocross because, again, you, you'll get an appreciation of the airtime and just the physics of the motorcycle, what the rider's doing, as well as, you know, the fact that you're seeing four motos, so four 35-minute races, largely from the same camera angles. So to have that drone in there, like, you know, people or TV broadcasters were persistent with the onboard technology because, you know, that's that's a camera that can get filled in within the first five to six seconds of a race and is redundant for the rest of the moto. But then also it's something to cut to just to show more dynamicism of, of motocross. So I, I don't know, props for having a go. Yeah, it's good to see advancements in technology. And that reminds me actually of another advance, advancement in technology that I really enjoy. Um, that would be the Polysport unbreakable levers. Do you remember all of the crashes and falls that you had and the levers that you destroyed because of that? Well, that's no longer a problem. Polysport released for pivot unbreakable levers, a lever set that never breaks. If you fall, they can be bent back to their original shape. Easy as that. Incredible, right? Um, many riders could have done with the Polysport unbreakable levers in Trentino because many just crashes and slide outs and whatever else. Um, thank you to Polysport for their continued support of the podcast. Aguada or Agada is next, and that is... Um, Polysport's hometown, pretty much, within reason. I believe they are 40 minutes away from Akada. So, yeah, we look forward to their home GP. That will be superb. You like that one, don't you? What? Polysport? Oh, no. Agada. <laughs> Agada. Um, <laughs> no, my young Lewis likes it. Present Lewis is upset that it isn't as good as young Lewis remembers. Uh, okay. Because my my overriding memory from Magada is just uh, interviewing um, Darren 
uh, Lawrence about Hunter one time while Jet was just sort of messing around outside on a Suzuki and racing the MX250 that weekend. And, uh, well, we never would have forecast, you know, what would um, come to be. But, um, you know, Jet was just a spindly, like, 14-year-old teenager, I think, trying to race a big 250. And it would have been utterly impossible to, you know, predict that we would see this... I don't know, phenomenon of uh, racing competence in the US just from that sort of brief rainy weekend in Portugal. My two memories from Portugal are A, um, I was pulled into a meeting with Yamaha and the person I was talking to was gently said to me like, do you want me to come with you? Because they thought that I was going to get um, killed. And B uh, <laughs> is a certain rider who I won't name was who two years ago was so unhappy with their team and bike that I bumped into them as they were walking into the track and they literally looked like a dead man walking. Like there was absolutely no spirit or happiness or just, I remember just being like, wow, you really are unhappy, aren't you? So those are my two memories from a from Goodness. Akada. Um, yeah. My, my young Lewis's memory, though, is 2005 when Cass Honda had a double podium with Josh Coppins and Yossi Vevelainen. That's young Lewis's. See, okay. young, look how full of hope and joy young Lewis is with a nice memory. <laughs> and then current I'm Lewis gonna, has just got I'm depressing add, memories. <laughs> I'm going to add two to that. Um, Rui Gonçalves winning. Uh, first Portuguese rider to ever win, you know, in a Portuguese Grand Prix. I think he was the only Portuguese rider to have won a Grand Prix, actually. So there you go. And also Ken Roxon making his Grand Prix debut. 2009, I think. Yeah. Finished something ridiculous like seventh overall. And, yeah, I want to uh, say he that went was the moment five. where you could tell something special was coming. Yeah, something special was coming. You could see straight away. Yeah, I would say that panned out. Um, speaking of something special coming, I feel as though Calvin Vlanderin is gathering some sort of steam and notoriety here. Again, criminally underrated. I would make a case that he is the most underappreciated MXGP rider. And full transparency, I texted him Sunday night and said, hey, just FYI, I really hope you get the respect that you deserve because I honestly believe you're doing well. So like, I genuinely believe this. Um, Trentino is not where you would typically expect him to shine. Maybe if he had done this in Sardinia, more people would have rolled their eyes and gone, nah, of course. But for him to do this in Trentino, that shows competence, that shows ability, that, that shows potential of like, this can be something. And I just hope that people aren't judging him too harshly. I have no uh, record of that, but I just hope that people are not judging him and expecting too much from the South African slash Dutchman slash whatever other nationality he chooses. <laughs> no, I agree. I couldn't say anything else. I mean, it was also assisted, of course, by making the start in the second mode. That's why he finished second. Uh, well, not why, of course. I mean, he rode really well. He kept it sort of, you know, he was largely error free and kept it all the way up to the checkered flag. But yeah, you're on the money there, Lewis. And that was a big, a big uh, kind of boost for Yamaha, really, in some difficult days. Uh, I want to be careful with how I say this, so give me a second as I try to... This is in no way happening, but in the MXGP paddock, there are strong rumours that there is some sort of discussion about the possibility, potentially, of Eli Tomac racing maybe some GPs this year, but, of course, it also depends on what he decides about outdoors. So although this is just rumour and speculation currently, there are talks about whether this could be facilitated potentially at some point this year. That was a lot of... What a brilliant statement. I, would, I just, you know... I can't wait for a I, news website to quote that because it would just be a hundred words of nonsense. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you used every possible non-committal uh, term... Um, Try to get angry at me for so, that. Uh, well, yeah, well done for emptying your vocabulary. Um, but yeah, why? That's the big question. Why uh, would Eli Tomac want to race to Memich GPs? And also, if he waited until the summer and you're coming over and you're considering something like Locket, which is a similar sort of track and terrain to Arco de Trento, and then followed the next week or week after by Lommel, uh, you know, the, the toughest sand track in the world, uh, Eli's just leaving himself open for like, you know, a world of pain, you know, is this, would that even be enjoyable? Because he's not going to come over here thinking I'm just going to have a nice holiday. I'm going to come on my family. You know, there has to be some sort of performance objective, right? Uh, yes. Um, I would say that Yamaha and Monster are not in a 
healthy state in MXGP at the moment, and the presence, the sheer presence of Eli in the paddock at one event would massively help um, justify the marketing budget that they have funded or injected into MXGP. Um, someone told me at the weekend that John Tomac, towards the end of his mountain bike career, did something similar, like dipped his toe in different international events to kind of keep it fresh. So I don't know. Um, probably given this potential possible maybe discussion too much uh, <laughs> too much light. But this, yeah, I, like I've done, I've made some phone calls. This is very much a discussion. Discussions happen if, all the time um, in the paddock and they never come materialize. It's a discussion. If he does a Prado and wants to do two to three Grand Prix to see what it's like, how it feels, how much you know he enjoys it with a view maybe towards a full-time ride, then I think that's entirely plausible. But then also just to come out and you know try to wrap your head around MHGP um, in what will be a short period of time, because also he's got a young family, so it's not going to be super easy just to sort of move over or travel back and forth however he's going to tackle it. But I mean, it'd be like you say, Louis, it'd be big news. It'd be something exciting. I mean, Eli Tomac trounced everybody in Glen Helen, uh, I want to say 2016. Uh, it was you know, ridiculous, ridiculous dominance. But, you know, uh, trying coming over to Europe and doing it, as we've seen before, it's not so easy. But uh, he would get major props or major respect for trying it. I wonder if, um, uh, what's the Indonesian branch of Yamaha Semkan? Despre Des uh, Semkat or something like that? Yeah, Sem is Semkan. I and then I, I think the second word is a D word. Um, we're not going to get sponsorship money from Semkan, just but anytime soon, obviously. <laughs> but um, I wonder, like, if you're them, then uh, maybe the Indonesian doubleheader is kind of a neutral track, uh, man made track, it, like, and the Indonesian market is so massive for these Japanese manufacturers. That could be of interest, I feel. And as you talk to that, I'm going to get my laptop charger because I forgot to plug it in. So enjoy talking about that for so one minute. So you're about to run out. Yep. All right, I'll talk tell, to myself Tell us then. about Tomac. Um, well, no, the, the, the point about Indonesia is pretty good because you would imagine that the, the climate and the weather condition is going to be as hot as it would be, you know, if you're in, doing some of the nationals during the summer. And it would also be a two week period where he doesn't have to worry about, you know, where am I? Where am I based? What are my family doing? You know, he's just like living out of a hotel, out of a suitcase for a while, getting the job done. But, you know, I mean, of course, to have a massive name like that coming over and, and attempting MHGPs is nothing but a positive thing, Lewis. Have you got energy now? Yes, my apologies. How unprofessional of me. Um, I am dismayed that I was <laughs> exposed in that way to the masses. And I do mean masses because everyone listens to this podcast, as I unfortunately have found out. Um, Sua made progress. Third in a moto. He's much better than that as a rider. But based on how this has gone, this is... Noted progress. He can be happy about that. Um, I feel like we haven't given Koldenoff enough credit. I mean, but this is similar. Like, do we expect... Do, we've not given Koldenoff much credit because we expect so much of Koldenoff. But actually, he's been doing fine. But I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't want to give Koldenoff applause for finishing seventh overall because he's so much better than that. But in the bigger picture, it has been okay. Not fantastic, just yeah, fantastic. Yeah, but I, I think very Glenn, very sort of dependable, occasionally spectacular. Uh, you know, I think he's actually been pretty consistent. I'm just looking it up now. He's eighth in the championship. Uh, he's got one, two, three, four top six results in sort of 50% of the motos. So, uh, you know, I just think, uh, you know, as we know, it's a great team, a lot of resources, very well set up, uh, running Fantics for the first time this year, a different brand anyway, if, it, if the technology is not remarkably different. But um, I'm just happy that, you know, we were kind of saying at one point a year or two ago, would Colden off transition into being a test rider, such as his professionalism and his feelings no, the bike? No, not we, not oh. we. <laughs> right. Uh, maybe I posited that theory. Um, and, you know, he's still going strong. He's still like, you know, a top five fringe guy. And there's, there's nobody are um, majorly injured in MHGP at the moment. I'm trying to check myself there because I know we're missing Alberto Ferrato, um, of course, Maxim Renault, um, Yago and Iago Gertz. So there are three riders there. I mean, arguably, would those three be bumping Glenn down the order? I, I, don't, I don't think so. 
Yeah, Ma- Maxime is the only one who you could say with certainty. Gertz, I imagine, would be in Koldenoff's yeah. in Koldenoff's range. Uh, jumping down the list here, Jonas uh, said on Instagram that he was too slow. Uh, I admire and applaud the transparency, as did Mark Deruva, who shared that to his story and told basically every other rider to stop talking shit, which was classic Mark <laughs> Deruva. Um, ben Watson, look, okay, okay. I no, realize. Wait, wait, wait. Go back there. Do you think? Go back to Paul okay. saying, you know, he wasn't good enough. Is and bearing what I'm, you know, in mind what I said earlier about riders in different series being transparent and truthful about what's going on. What do you think about that? Is that a good thing to do by saying I'm just not good enough this weekend? Yeah, that's. I mean, great. He's, he can be very secure. He's, he's he's got a good deal. I mean, he's very secure in that team. He's maybe not sweating on like a contract extension or his future. Uh, you know, it's very easy to say that when perhaps you don't have the all the pressure that you would know that some younger riders, the lesser experience, are probably um, balancing. No, his contract is up this year, so there is that. That is in existence. Um, I would come at it from the complete opposite perspective. If I was a team manager, I like that because that shows aspiration, that shows self-awareness. Um, maybe if I look at the results and I see Paul's in ninth overall, yeah, ninth overall, then I'm like, oh, that's not very good. And then I see his Instagram and I'm like, okay, he also realizes that wasn't very good. You get me? Like it adds, if I'm a team yeah. manager, it adds a level of um, consciousness to the situation that I like because it's like, it's someone who's not got his head up his ass. For lack yeah, of a better I agree. Term. I think it takes um, to sort of take one of Evgeny Bobrychev's, um you know, terms. It takes big coconuts to be able to actually admit that and, you know, and maybe double down and try to get better the following week. Yeah, I just, it's, it's not really a post you could do very often, though, is it? No, yeah. Two, twice in a row, that's not good. But for one weekend, um, yeah. And he's been great this year. So we know that Trentino is an outlier versus the first couple of rounds. So please disregard, this is in no way funny or a joke or tongue-in-cheek. This is not Watson Wagon. This is me being sincere. So please disregard all previous content from the last 10 years and just listen to the words coming out of my (laughs) mouth without judgment he is doing so good if you track his starts he's starting outside of the top 20 every week and coming back to 10th 11th 9th in trentino of all places it's honestly deserving of applause and credit and um recognition and i really want to get that across and in no way am i making any jokes here clear yeah, I think you have to give credit where it's due. I think we skipped over like Valentin Guillaume is also having a sort of career renaissance. But to come back to Ben, I think your point's valid, Lewis. And, you know, but you just, you're willing him to sort out his starts because he's obviously riding well. Let's not forget he's a former GP winner in, in Arco de Trento as well. So he can go extremely fast around that track. It's not like one of his bogey tracks, which we know have popped up from time to time. But I think, um, you know, Watson, ironically, because he exploded onto the sort of international scene in EMX 250 when he was only 15 years old, you know, is, is one of those riders that's, you know, discovering himself and discovering his potential as the seasons go on. So uh, I think, you know, what he's doing on the beta is 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 solid. I mean, he's 11th in the championship. Um, he did well at the weekend. Uh, just keep going this way and he's going to end up sort of top seven, top eight. Yeah, and I just hope that yields some reward um yeah i just hope that this isn't because if you look at the results you do just go eh anonymous sort of results but if you look further at what's going on you realize there is something there and that's what we are here to do and seeing as the masses listen to that maybe someone can take notes of what i've just said but but factories look at potential don't they so and, and i think kawasaki have tried to measure ben's potential yamaha obviously have when you kind of think well what other team or what kind of outfit is really going to maybe take a gamble and give him an opportunity again in the future? Because they might think, okay, well, here's someone who's still getting better, or here's somebody who's learning and gathering experience and they can help us improve our motorcycle. Or they can say, well, you know, what do we do with Ben? Because, you know, is he ever going to arise to the position where he's going to be a championship contender if we, sorry, a podium contender if we give him the right motorcycle? In my honest so, opinion, uh, you know, in my honest opinion, uh, the potential is he's starting 20th, finishing 10th. So if we can get him to start 9th, maybe he can knock on the door of the top five. And to your point, and this will get me in trouble maybe, um, 
he was great at Yamaha. We that was often overlooked as well. This is kind of where my my um spirited Watson talks came from because in 2021 the field was so healthy that he was finishing fifth through ninth and that was great because the field was so healthy that you possibly couldn't expect more but similar to this year you look at the results and you're like "Mm, average and then to your point about Kawasaki look based on how it went with Mitch Evans as well I believe there's enough evidence there to suggest that there's some sort of um, weird dojo with that second seat uh or mojo perhaps or mojo or dojo Dojo is where you do karate i'm inclusive (laughs) i'll happily i mean (laughs) maybe they should have put him in a dojo to you know uh hike up the aggression uh but yeah i agree Lewis. i mean his day his rookie season of yamaha was maybe harshly judged he just had the poor luck to have had maxime renault on a surge right behind him uh, for a three-rider factory team. And there were flashes of what he could potentially do. I mean, you and I were talking about it at the time. Ben certainly merited a second chance, a second year. I mean, we weren't the only ones of that opinion. I mean, I think Jeremy Sewell was also quite vocal about it at the time. But uh, yeah, I think Ben's just, you know, he's been given a chance with Peter. He's taken what it is. And I think he's delivering for them. I, I don't know how, how happy they are with how he's contributing towards the development of the motorcycle, but you know, in terms of results and, and profile, he's, he's throttling the thing. Uh, quickly, I've been thinking this recently. Is it weird that Beta have known... Sh- uh, why can't I talk nowadays? Is it weird that Beta have shown no intention to make a 250? We're now five, four years into the experiment and there's no word of like the next step. Is that weird or no? It just depends on the resources of the factory. I mean, it's a very sort of small manufacturer, isn't it? Yeah, true. I don't know. I just, I, yeah. I feel like... I can't, it's a good question. I can't remember exactly, but I do feel as though when they first entered motocross, there was some talk of a 250 coming down the line, but maybe I'm just, uh, you know, making that up as I do. Um, Can I change subject with a yes. question for you? Are you still enthused about Kevin Horgmo? Uh, that was two results outside the top 10. Um, he's still on the free, he's 10th in the world championship. Yeah, that's in here. Okay, infused is maybe a bit far now, but um, it was on par with what he's been doing. He's been between 9th and 12th in every single moto this year. So, yeah, that 9 to 12, it, uh, maybe the 12 of that range isn't so great, but the 9 is great. Um, and he's spent most of the time in the top 10 than out of it. So, yeah, he. He also deserves credit, as I've said many times. Um, Jumping, well, first of all, quickly, Christoph Charlier raced, which is just, I have no idea where on earth that came from. Did he get any points? No. Um, But I have no idea. Absolutely no idea. I I thought he died. I I thought he disappeared. (laughs) Like, I've not heard that name in so long. Um, And not on the result sheet, Rowan van der Mostijk, who had a flare-up of his pre-season injury, which I presume is the knee injury he sustained in Hawkstone Park, at Hawkstone Park. And now they say he's going to get checkups this week to determine what the path forward is. It's quite vague, to be honest. Um, I don't really know what comes next. I wouldn't be surprised if he races round five. I also wouldn't be surprised if he never races for HRC again. This, The crux of this situation is this career is on life support at this point, I do believe. Yeah, it's definitely at the uh, metaphorical crossroads, isn't it? And, you know, I feel sorry for the guys at HRC having, you know, manoeuvred to give Rowan an opportunity and then it just hasn't really worked out in terms of his health or readiness. Uh, But, you know, questions have to be asked and, you know, what is going on? Like you say, what is going on and when's he going to turn up? But it might just be on a race-by-race basis. I like to ask questions of All Balls Racing because they have such a fine range of power sports brands that um, the knowledge inside the company is endless. The All Balls Racing Group is a combination of the finest aftermarket power sports brand from across the US and Europe, combining OEM level engineering and design capabilities with a world-class supply chain makes them the largest global supplier of critical aftermarket hard parts for the power sports industry. You can trust the All Balls Racing Group to provide the exact fitment and best quality in the industry at a price that fits your budget. All Balls Racing have everything to keep you running. And we'll see if Rowan van der Mostijk can continue running. 
to tie that in very nicely. Uh, on to MX2, where Liam Everts won his fourth GP and his third GP without winning a moto. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Yeah. Does that was, mean uh, anything at all? Yeah, 3-2. Th no, it means he's very good at Arco. It means his starts are pretty good, and he's still on, on the way back from that broken thumb, I want to say, uh, memory fade from pre-season. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a track, of course, last year where he got his first podium finish. Uh, it was just a very, a very kind of Liam Everts Grand Prix, really, where you know he just rode completely within his capabilities and you know banked the points um, at a time when the other riders were making mistakes. I mean, Kaido Wolf, again, just continuing his his twenty twenty four form in the first moto, riding really well, but then in the second, of course, just not being able to deliver. Where did he finish? Eighth or something like that uh yeah i mean liam where others fell down he just stayed up and made it happen can we get a comment please on the fact that liam everts is currently uh please hold please hold do 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 liam everts is currently 11 points down on andrea adamo despite racing one less round uh a comment well that's why i think everts is still he's not out of the championship hunt because yes he missed one grand prix but when you tally those points over so many races across the season you know it's uh inexplicable to think that people like simon lagenfeld or lucas kuhn and kai de wolf andrea adama are also going to have zeros but um, everts is just like slowly slowly building his way up that was a very good politically correct answer that i cannot really go back on i was more wanting you well, to... adama has also been no adama's also you've been very public about the fact that he's not quite ready and the setup of the ktm hasn't been you know optimum for him this year but then i also have seen enough from him compared to last year where i think he's also going to be winning motos yes well he's done that already um spain second moto was it there you go he is very very yeah. vocal though isn't he about his setup like i i get a lot of texts from people in the paddock saying like adamo is really unhappy really really unhappy and it's um yeah it's almost concerning how much i hear this to be honest I don't know if we talked about this on the last podcast, Lewis, but also when a rider is, you know, when people say, you know, who's to blame? Is it the bike or the rider? Like, you know, there's been some debate about Chase Sexton with this. You know, has his season been defined because, you know, the KTM hasn't been to his liking or, or you know, it's more to the KTM's fine and it's more about what Chase is bringing to it. Surely they're the same thing. You know, you have to, a rider has to try and sort out his motorcycle if he's not happy with it. So I don't think you can sort of blame one or the other. I believe that technology has gotten to such a point now and the level has gotten to such a point where everyone is at 99%. So they are all looking for this 1% that is actually unobtainable because in no way is anything perfect in life. So, um, and I believe that's where people, some riders are like okay with that and some riders can't process the fact that this 1% isn't obtainable, so they're just constantly searching and trying to get it and to get it and get it and digging a hole where they are actually subtracting from the 99% that they started with. Um, and I believe that as technology has advanced in the sport, as the level has advanced, that is only getting worse. And who knows where that will be in five years' time when inevitably um, we have hovercrafts and stuff. But I think... I think it was, I mean, there are mitigating factors. If some factory says to you, this is the new bike, you must race this. And, it, you, you know, you much preferred the model of last year, for example. It's still part of your professional responsibility to try to get that new bike, you know, as, as good as it can be. Uh, you know, what sort of, how much pressure you put on it. Maybe someone like Adama feels in a public space, he can say comments to try and push um, his message or, you know, his mission a little bit more. But, you know, I think uh, it's, it has to be a collaborative thing. So, um, you know, undoubtedly they're working towards it. I think we saw the sort of same thing with Prado in his first year on the Gas Gas where he wasn't so over the moon about the chassis that he had. But then, you know, he had different versions to test. Tony Cairoli was also doing testing work at the time. But uh, I still think, you know, Dharma is a, a little bit, he's a more confident rider. I think he's a more aggressive rider this year. And in Trentino, he just didn't get the starts in comparison to like Everts to be able to make an impression at his home Grand Prix. Can we talk about the fact that Martino Bonacci, um, who was Adamo's agent early in his career, was it official agent or was it like, um, I know he was heavily involved, is 
kind of fronting the Ducati plans. So I wonder how much of you a mean target Martino Adamo Bianchi. is. What did I say? Oh, okay. Uh, Biacci. Well, um, maybe I'm talking about someone <laughs> okay. different to you. Who knows? Maybe Perhaps. maybe I'm not, we're not talking about the same guy. Um, but I wonder how much of a target Adamo is for Ducati, especially with how unhappy he is currently as well. Yeah, but also I would suggest, you know, KTM just putting their eggs on Jeffrey Hurlings for the MHGP class again for next year. Uh, of course, you know, Jeffrey was by himself last year because Tom Vial took the sort of left field route to go to the AMA uh, when he had initially signed up to step into onto the 450. Um, you know, you'd imagine that Adamo is out of Liam Everts and also Sasha Kunin, of course, the, the most obvious choice to have two and two for 2025. Uh, yeah, but, you know, like you say, Lewis, I mean, if Ducati are ready to go and they come in with a checkbook, then, you know, and if they want an Italian rider um, and they don't want to take Lupino, then Adamo is is the number one choice. But um, I, I want your thoughts on Thibaut Benestan because, you know, even his second overall um, in Arco de Trento, another podium finish, are we, is he kind of in that sort of geyser space where he's, you know, building back up, taking points, not doing um, a bad job? but then also not like uh, doing enough to bump the Husqvarna's out of the limelight. My immediate reaction is how good do we expect Thibaut to be? Like, is second overall in Trentino so amazing for him that we just, we just need to blindly applaud him? Do we expect more of him? Do we expect him to be a consistent race win threat? Is that the goal? I honestly believe that and each person's, um, each person's personal viewpoint of that dictates how the opinion you form obviously that's common sense and that's why there's sometimes disagreements with what's said on this podcast and what and whatnot because each of us are basing our opinions and our perspective off of the wildly different starts that we're starting with um not sure how that's really relevant i just kind of did a little mental speech there <laughs> um but no it was a, it's, a, it's an important yeah. step forward uh, yamaha's first podium of the year i don't know he's now third in the championship i don't know if this turns into some magical run where he starts to knock on the door of title contention. But if he can do this consistently, that's good, I think, for Thibaut. I do believe that maybe he's slightly not overrated. That's harsh. But I do believe that some people believe in him a little too much. Like, I don't know. Like I would argue that maybe this, with the occasional win here and there, is his peak. Um, but let's not forget, this was, Yama, uh, this was Hutton Metal's first MX2 podium as well as the factory team, yes. which or because yeah. of the branding and everything, it's just lost completely that Yamaha did change teams because they look exactly the same. But we must remember a completely different MXGP team and completely different MX2 team. Yeah, the Yamaha's um, structure in MXGP just continues to baffle, doesn't it? Uh, I, you know, I don't really know what it's about. It's um, switching partners, switching priorities. Uh, it is confusing. But um, as for Benestan himself, I think now is the time to show something. Okay, he's had some poor luck of injuries, but um, and Yago Gertz is, was the number one rider on the YZ250F for the last four seasons. Uh, but now he's pretty much that he's got that top billing. So I think he has to be posting second positions on a, a more regular basis, if not more. I know that an American team has reached out to Benestan about the future. So there's that. I don't okay. know. Okay. Make of that what you will. Um, uh, sorry, I completely closed for results. Uh, well, Lagenfelder. Simon Lagenfelder. Yeah. So where are we at? Because I don't know anymore. Someone made the <laughs> remark to me that he's Prado, and if he gets a whole shot, he can win. But otherwise, not so much. But I don't feel as though it's that start dependent. Or am I coming? Am I now in recovery, and I'm seeing? the truth of what's actually happening here and looking back and going, wow, I really was high that entire time and had a completely inaccurate viewpoint of the man who doesn't even know my name. <laughs> um, I think the potential is more frequently obvious than it was in the past, but then just those kind of similar to Febra, those little error prone moments are still there. I mean, to go what eight one, I mean, that's, that kind of sums up Simon, really, doesn't it? And he's going to have to like, kind of narrow that gap to be more of a championship threat, because that's what Kaida Wolf has done more emphatically this year. I just, I think it was a qualifying race 
when he was just like battling with Elzinger for like the whole race. And I was just like, this is not the Lagenfelder that I've been championing for the last 20 years. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm starting to see like reality. Um, I'm not so unhinged now, and it's scary to be honest. I might have to do some retraction. Lewis, he didn't look very. He didn't look very happy at all after the race, and I think you know, knowing that he's sort of disappointing you is not going to add to the um, the the feeling of pressure and and everything else that he's currently under. I honestly so don't even know if he's aware else. of my um my support. I wouldn't. I would bet he's not. I, be, I would bet he doesn't know my name. Um, he could be an avid listener. Um, oh, Simon, if you're on Instagram, and you know, let us know. Send us send send a message. Well, as we're learning, everyone is an avid listener, which is unfortunate in some cases. <laughs> um, so Kai DeWolf, uh, brilliant first moto, absolutely superb. And especially on a track that should be his weakness, has been his weakness. And then even more impressive, crashed in turn one of moto two and came all the way back to eighth with a badly grazed back. I would argue that the Kai of the past would have maybe pay too much attention to the grazed back, the adversity, the amount of time he has to make up and kind of been a bit not as focused, um, but he, ha he moved forward with conviction. I would argue certainly squeezed the most out of that moto. Um, and yeah, this is, in my mind, and I said this to Rasmus yesterday, this was more important and more impressive to me than his previous wins. Yep. Yeah, I think it's spot on. And I'm really curious to see what he's going to do in Portugal because this is one of the tracks, probably more than any other on the calendar, where the climate building up to the Grand Prix has a big, big influence. Like if it's wet and it has, you know, it's been raining quite profusely in the build up to the Grand Prix, then that track really changes into something incredibly rutty and rough. Whereas if it's dry, then it's very hard packed, very fast. Uh, you know, not a lot of deal of difference between the lap times can be a bit sort of static. You know, different for difficult for riders to make up the time. I, I wonder what how Kai will adapt to the two conditions that we may have there. Um, also noteworthy is his teammate Lucas Coonan um, crashed on Tuesday before the Grand Prix and suffered a shoulder injury. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say exactly, but let me tell you, it's a significant shoulder injury. Like I was shocked when I got told what the actual injury is and the fact that he went nine ten or 10-9, whatever way around. So he salvaged um, his title hopes somewhat. Um, very impressive. He will need the two weeks off to recover. Um, but yeah, he deserves uh, much applause because I cannot believe that he raced with what he did. Um, and now you just revealed that information. Rasmus probably won't come on the next. No, no, I didn't say what it is. We know it here. I think it was said that he had a shoulder injury. So I've just confirmed that. But it's more, it's not... My point is, when he said, oh, I'm working through a shoulder injury, I presumed, oh, he banged his shoulder, you know? Like, ah, oh, he's got a dead shoulder. Like, is it, like, it's a bit sore. No, no, no. Is that, like, it's actually quite impressive. No? Have I just done it? Have I got myself in trouble again? Have I done it again? No, no, no. no. Okay. No, no, no. no. Okay. Cool, yeah, but then um, cool. someone else will get involved. Because, I mean, Sasha, Sasha had a good start again, was running right. He was unlucky to have a technical point in the first moto, I think. Um, but then still, you know, he's just really bizarre to watch, isn't he? He's like incredibly quick and bustling and aggressive. And then you just kind of feel how long is it going to be until the first mistake comes that really costs him? Because you can't do that at the front of MX2. Because even if you have just the slightest off, then it's going to be two or three riders that will just zip you in a second. And that's it. You're down the order. Uh, I just wonder when, when it will be that Sasha turns the page, you know, See, it might not I, be this year. I would take a different stance. I almost believe that Trentino was the turn of the page. Maybe I'm off oh, base wow. completely, but uh, yeah, technical issue in Moto One was it? Moto Two, One, One. Um, yeah. Other than one, that, where was he when he went out? He was up there, wasn't he? Third? Yeah, it was like yeah, fourth. I think he was. No, he, he got passed by two other riders. I think he was in fourth. Uh, I believe, well, the lap chart is missing a rider, but I believe third. Um, but still, so for him to be in that position so late in the race, brilliant, much improved. Um, yeah, I feel like, I don't know why, maybe I'm off base again, but I feel like this was the first time where it wasn't the same old, same old with Sasha, and there was a little bit of light, maybe? No? I think we. I think he has to get to the podium first. He needs to get to the podium, and also that first motor win, and then you know maybe he's gonna sort of open the floodgate a little bit to be cliched. 
but you know it's coming i mean he can start the on the bike he's sort of like tom vial is straight out of the gate you know into sort of the to the fourth round of the pack um but yeah it's just the mistakes lewis and i just hope he sort of keeps injury free which also seems to be something that lucas is um having problems with can you compare Sasha to another factory rider in the past? Like a young guy who's just, who's been given his chances, but it's like, eh. Like, you know, like I can't really recall or compare another um, rider. No, he, he just seems to be doing everything faster. It's like more urgent. He's like cramming, say, uh, a full season for Paul Jonas uh, for the first time in the factory team into two or three Grand Prix, you know, where all the signs are there of potential. But it's it's, it's it's both exciting and worrying at the same time. And remember, um, Sasha is supposedly meant to be the better of the two when it all comes together. Um, from what really? I've heard... I thought Lucas was the better of the two. No. Uh, well, as far as I've been told, Sasha is meant to be the better of the two and the father even believes that. I thought Lucas was the better rider, but Sasha had the better kind of more you know uh what's the word uh, was more of a fighter you know had the attitude of like all everything to win kind of thing okay well now i question now who knows then one of us is right um maybe we should do that on this podcast from now on just we'll cover all bases and then end every conversation with yeah. one of us is right <laughs> um, <laughs> um right so do we want to do anything else from mx2 or should we move on to our uh ending random topics that maybe uh i think uh, in random topics a quick um you know camden mcclellan after his podium finish uh at the last grand prix in sardinia uh taking a top five again so good news for triumph that's the only thing i'd say i may move my lagenfelder stock over to mcclellan stay tuned I've got are you this. allowed to do that i only have to I'm only supposed to be a little bit loyal i mean certainly beyond four grand prix well i think i've been i think i've Gets done around 10 Gets around 10. Okay, we'll do like a mid-season switch maybe. But I have been by Lagenfelder's there side for like four years. So loyal is my middle name. Yeah, don't lose faith. I'm loyal. <laughs> um, right, before we get onto some random topics which are of interest, let me tell you about EVS Sports, the original protective gear company. EVS Sports has been protecting champions and riders for almost 40 years and does not plan to stop anytime soon. What started out as one knee brace has evolved into a full line of protective gear to help keep riders safe while they do what they love. Check out evs-sports.com to see the same protective gear that pros RJ Hampshire, Kyle Chisholm, Axel Hodges and Travis Pastrana all wear every day. Thank you to EVS, thank you to All Balls Racing and thank you to Polisport. Right, one uh, topic I wanted to discuss with you, actually we'll start with Stark. So Stark released a PR this week about an additional 25 million investment from someone called Big Bets, which Big Bets does not sound like a company that I would take seriously, <laughs> but clearly <laughs> they are very serious. Um, I guess they were, they were originally an investor, but they have upped their investment by 25 million, which would indicate to me that Stark are like about to motor forward a little bit. Uh, yeah, I think they're an, initially a stakeholder oh, in okay. the company. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, I have to reread the press release, but yeah, the long and short of it is that Stark Future has, you know, significant injection of capital again, which is going to help with their expansion of production. And you'd have to imagine that, you know, they're not just going to be sitting there producing Stark Vargs for the next three or four years. There's going to be other models, uh, maybe an enduro, perhaps something for the street, maybe some sort of pit bike or junior bike. You'd imagine a small kind of electric bike would be the most common or the most sensible direction to take. I mean, that's where we've seen people like KTM moving as well. They seem to focus a lot of their energy uh, in, in, their, in the electric side in development for junior bikes. So um, that would also be something you think Stark would do. But I mean, Stark are still very young players in the game, aren't they? It's very much going to be about uh, distribution, getting people on the technology. I mean, having Instagram posts and showing people racing and trying it out is one thing, uh, but actually getting people to twist the throttle and see how fantastic that motorcycle is, um, having ridden it myself, is another thing altogether. So, uh, you know, you can order a Stark online and, you know, perhaps thanks to this injection, they're going to be able to offer more uh, purchases online. But, uh, you know, they still are very much, I think, 
in in the growth phase, Lewis. But I mean, the racing is another topic altogether, and I think we've touched it on on this podcast. I don't know what the the future direction can be for electric dirt bikes. Uh, it seems the FIM um, at the moment are saying, nope, you you have to stick in your own little side series. But uh, you know, I just wonder how quickly that might change. I wonder. Well, I'm not fully versed on this uh, drama. But I know that there have been some production delays with Stark. Uh, people not getting the bikes when expected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't know if that's already been fixed, but I would imagine this 25 million is mostly going to go in that area. That would be common sense, no? Or is it? Do you foresee a different situation? Yeah, I mean, it ha- I think it has to be. Uh, I mean, I'm based in Barcelona, and Stark is maybe a 20 minute drive from from the city center. And I've been to the initial factory building that they have, and they've been. I've visited the new one as well, and you know you cannot compare them for size. I mean, it's it's incredible. The uh, the initial setup. Uh, I think when I wandered around there, they had only a, you know a marginal piece of the a small piece of the new facility uh, ready for productions of Stark bugs. So now you think with this with this investment, it's going to go even bigger. But that's it's all kind of positive news, I think. Um, you know, however your feelings might be on electric bikes, the fact that this company are independently finding this sort of financial backing is is something that should be noticed, I think. Uh, I think start one thing they have to do now is work maybe more on their marketing, more on their relations within the industry, um, just to make sure they're not going to be like an outer and be just this sort of weirdly kind of independent firm stuck on the side that now and again pop into consciousness. They need to be doubling down you know we need to be listening to stuff like uh, vital or pulp and, and hearing about stark and hearing about the varg and hearing about this new race um electronic app setup that they have uh you know they need to be doubling down i think on the core audience yeah maybe just they need to integrate themselves into the ecosystem more rather than just being because yeah you're right independent is the best way to put it at the moment it feels like they are on the outside trying to break into this friendly circle or not so friendly sometimes that the industry has and they just need to yeah. put themselves in the picture more i think don't underestimate the difficulty of the politics involved um when it comes to the distribution side and you know just because you make a new motorcycle that's fantastically good and has a lot of potential it's not going to be so easy to suddenly sell it uh, you know there's there's all sorts of things going on there and there's a lot of market share and other people having their say and whatever else so it's uh yeah it's not an easy business but um you know the, the thing that you can do as stark is be transparent and you know particularly with a client base and also in such a small niche kind of market and industry as well also just try to make as many friends as possible to spread your word so uh you know don't have any airs or graces and, and try and keep humble but um you know they are on the business side seem to be killing it uh, finally, uh, maybe this is irrelevant, but and maybe this will be a short discussion. But you are MotoGP mm-hmm. man as well as podcast man, and Liberty Media, who own F1, recently purchased all of MotoGP. Some of MotoGP. Eighty-six percent. Eighty-six percent. Yeah. Um, Liberty Media is strange number. Yeah, uh, yeah, that is really strange actually. Um, and if you're doing eighty-six percent, why not just do it all? Like, just go the whole way. Um, who would want to hold on to twelve percent? Anyway, um, or fourteen, or fourteen. Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> um, <laughs> um, oh, Lewis, I shudder, shudder to think of your profit margins. <laughs> um, so Liberty Media um, have been credited with massively pushing Formula One forward, <laughs> getting it into new spaces. Um, it's much more in front of my eyeballs now than it was previously. My question to you is how much would motocross benefit from this? And do you foresee, because honestly, I maybe I've got the um, hierarchy wrong, but I would believe that MotoGP wouldn't even be on their radar. So clearly there's some sort of uh, motorsports uh, goal here. So does motocross appear on the radar somewhat uh, eventually? Well, I mean, Supercross is still a very lucrative property for Feld, right? So yeah. that's, um, I think you're more inclined to be saying to, you know, what what, what would Feld do with a property like that? I mean, MotoGP, uh, the stats that come to mind, was seen by 2.4 million people at the circuits in 2023. Um, it has very lucrative TV um, 
licensing deals, license, it's not a licensing deal, um, TV contracts, let's say, for distribution on and certainly in European territories uh, with TNT Sports in the UK, that's also now amplified to the US. So I think it's easier to see MotoGP than ever before in America. Like I said, I was in Texas last weekend and that Grand Prix has felt a little bit vacant, um, a little bit kind of not deserted, but there was it didn't have the hype that it merited in the past. And I thought um, for this round three of the 2024 season, there was a lot more people, there was a lot more buzz. Um, the paddock was rammed, you know, there's people having tours, uh, there was just like a feeling of, you know, more importance around it. Liberty Media is essentially a media group, whereas Dawn of Sports before were owned by an investment capital firm. Um, so basically someone who just siphons off cash rather than trying to look into do something with the sport and the property. So, yeah, I mean, it would be very interesting to see how Liberty now as a controlling hand on MotoGP change things, Lewis, because... We saw MXGP acquired um, by Infront, which was a company that also had the rights to World Superbike in the past. They bought out Ustream. And we haven't seen, you know, any significant sort of changes there, really. Uh, and I think initially with Liberty and, and Dorna, you won't see the boat being rocked too much uh, for 2024. And of course, that deal still needs to be ratified by the right legislation. But for 2025, there could be some other things. I don't know how much Liberty, they obviously value their Netflix series with Drive to Survive and what it did for F1. But then also, will that translate to a motorcycle sport, which is not as relatable as driving a car? And, you know, would they even want to try and repeat the recipe? There's already some schools of thought that says that stream sports on streaming services are a done thing. And, you know, you need to find the next sort of media platform or way to spread awareness. I don't believe in that. I mean, every time... I open Netflix and you see a NASCAR or a tennis or a golf or a cycling or a you know Premier League football program that's still unbeatable exposure. I think you know something like Supercross needs that. Um, motocross, uh, you know, it would be amazing if something like was on there instead of just being um, series produced by like Red Bull and, and Monster and put on YouTube. So yeah, it's uh, it, I think it's interesting times and the fact that MotoGP now is essentially Amer it's an American entity could you know mix things up a little bit but um yeah we'll see i do feel as though like okay maybe liberty never look at motocross but i do believe that what they do to moto gp will capture the attention of i guess i'm talking mxgp predominantly um because it's closer to this so maybe you can't really make comparisons to f1 it's a million miles away but i feel like mxgp or in front or whoever makes i guess it's still dan who makes those decisions but um who would like there's more maybe <laughs> maybe you um yeah maybe they just take more inspiration from what happens in moto gp now to realize what they need to do but you are right like in front took over and aside from there being a logo now on the backdrops and whatnot um i would say that absolutely nothing has changed at all Maybe there is a strategy I and mean, they might be working to a five-year plan for that, you know. Um, I would like to know when the next monster renewal is up for the title sponsorship. Uh, you know, something like that could also alter the the shape of the series. And I remember when Monster originally came in uh, to be the principal sponsors of MXGP. I want to say around, I can remember there being talks of it when we went to Glen Helen. Uh, goodness, is it over 10 years ago now? 2013, 14? Anyway, um, you know, we quickly saw uh, a transformation in the aesthetics of the World Championship, the start gates, the, you know, the peripheries of the circuit, um, maybe even the two-tier pit lane um, and the, the start, the, the oh, what's it called? The, the area behind the start gate Skybox. where the podium is. Um, Skybox, there we go. And there, was, there, were any, there were plenty of other ideas at the time. I remember Fox wanting to erect like a hot air balloon that would be you know, floating above the circuit for VIPs to give them a, a unique perspective on stuff. There was all sorts of talks about how the MHGP experience would be different. Perhaps there is still some lingering effects of the pandemic um, and people trying to recover you know, lost revenue from that before they can splurge on some other direction. But yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, you know, those are the kind of inner workings of the sport we don't know about. And remember as well that MotoGP is a four billion dollar sport and business. Um, and it, there's no comparison of MHGP purely because of those TV contracts. I'm just on Infront's website. Um, first of all, the deal with MXGP is 
going to run until the end of 2036. So there is a lot of room and scope yeah. for them to maybe make changes. But I'm on their website and I can't really see like what other sports in front have. You mentioned they used to do uh, World Superbike. Do they like? Do you know of any other sports? I thought they had a skiing sport of some kind. <laughs> No. Well, I mean, uh, in front motor races to have um, snow cross, but uh, yeah, I, I I couldn't tell you. I mean, I remember looking up when they made the acquisition of MXGP, but when was that? 2018? Was yeah, that I, I was going to say 1918. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah, like, it's their leading sports property now. It seems like based on their website, they mainly handle media rights. Like it says they amplify the impact of the Premier League, the World Endurance Championship, but they don't have that obviously they're just like involved weird maybe we'll do more research on this we'll ask dan dan's always good for and a fountain of knowledge <laughs> um and I, I i anticipate that soon we'll be getting an email to tell us to stop calling him dan so i look forward to that <laughs> uh, um, well why is he sending it to us just to send it to you know uh, um i don't know what what do you what do you call it what's the company that do the the tv production for supercross um, yeah, go Fell TV's company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I don't, uh, NBC, I guess, or Fell. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. Right, we are done. Any final thoughts? No, that's it. Um, quite a break for MHTP. Uh, I don't know if we want to do a show next week or something, um, talking over a subject. And we do have to confirm a guest for the next next show, Lewis. That has to be a priority. Well, how about in this break we try <laughs> our hardest to do a show an hour with a guest and we just like a former rider and we just poke in their career poke around a little bit see what we can find out um yeah, <clears throat> yeah well um let's just put it out i mean you know, on youtube or social media send us a message who would you like to hear from and we'll see if they if that person would like to talk to us i'm thinking uh coppins stephen Sword, ben townley um that sort of range marvin um just purely on his gp days uh yeah that's what i'm thinking so you will do some work and let us know who you want to hear from right thank you to polisport all balls racing and evs sports for their continued support of this podcast if you would like to get involved or you have a complaint or comment about this podcast hit me up at lphillips at vitalmx.com uh, happy to receive interest or complaints. Um, Adam is sick of being my manager. So <laughs> give him a break. I'm not dealing with any complaints. You um, know, to get it. No, thank you, uh, everyone, for listening. Uh, do reach out. If you even uh, that email address, if you have a question, I do apologize to a fan called Wingnut, I think. <laughs> okay. which doesn't I know that sounds that sounds like I just made that up I know but um Drew Huff uh on Twitter he's wingnut uh, he sent in a very good long question that we didn't get to we will get to that next time so apologies um and yeah feel free to reach out with questions or whatever else you want us to talk about we're a loose program here we'll happily talk about just about anything right we may see you also, before also feel free also feel free to send positive comments guys you know, Lewis said he wants complaints. You don't have to write in complaining. If you enjoy the show, then also send a message to that. Yeah, it's been a difficult two weeks. Just difficult two weeks. Um, so yeah, reach out with anything that's on your mind at all. Uh, we may appear before the next round in Portugal, which is the first weekend of May. So keep an eye out for that. But if not, we will see you after Agada. Thanks for listening.